So tonight we're going to learn about the history of the mill yard here in Meredith Village. Our presenter is a familiar face to many of you, a member of our executive board, John Hopper. John is a retired commercial banker who lives with his wife, Linda, in Center Harbor. They own a cottage on Bear Island that was first purchased by John's uh, parents in 1945. And John has the distinction of spending at least part of every summer of his life on Bear Island. John's a historian by training. He's received his BA in US history from Wake Forest University, a master's degree in African history from Ohio University, and his PhD in Southern African history from Yale. He's the author of The History of Bear Island and the Bear Island Chapel books. And he currently writes articles for the Meredith News focusing on local Meredith history. John has been busy conducting research uh, on the history of Meredith Village that hopefully at some point in the future will be part of a, of a book. So tonight's program will feature some of that research and some of that material. So please join me in welcoming John Hopper. Thank you, John. Um, before I begin my talk, I would just like to take uh, one moment to publicly thank uh, John Edgar for spearheading these sessions for the last five, six, seven years. And also thank him, John has retired from town office for all the amazing work you have done for Meredith and for us. Uh, it's often behind the scenes, but it's greatly appreciated. Yeah. So tonight's topic is going to be the history of the Meredith Village Milliard, 1750 to 2020. And so we're going to cover 270 years here in the space of something less than that, uh, I hope. Um, we begin with just the, a complete understanding that Meredith Village exists where it does today because the mill yard exists where it is today. And the mill yard exists there because of water power. And going back before anybody settled here, the uh, Water power was a stream that connected Lake Wakiwan, known as Measley Pond, with Winnipesaukee. And you can see the uh, cove coming out of Wakiwan. Uh, the stream doesn't show up as well, uh, but uh, that is the source of our being here. And in fact, water power was the source of probably 95% of all villages and towns in New England back in the uh, 18th and 19th centuries. Now the waterfall, it's not just a stream that was coming across, but it was a waterfall as well. The waterfall measures about somewhere around 38 feet, 40 feet. You can see it at the waterfall itself. If you take a look uh, just down the back from the upper parking lot, look down behind the Mill Falls building, you'll see how sharp that cliff is. That was the natural path of the, uh, of the stream. Now that stream did not uh, lose sight or was not lost sight of in 1750 and then in 1753 when the future town of Meredith was granted, uh, the proprietors who were going to settle the town authorized surveyors to come up and divide the property into lots. And the first survey simply did Division One, which is uh, predominantly Laconia. But on his survey map, and you can see here, he circled the uh, waterfall stream coming out of uh, Lake Wakiwan. So they knew this was an important place years before anybody ever set foot to uh, settle the land. In 1770, another survey was undertaken, this time by a gentleman named Ebenezer Smith, who was the father of Meredith. He was the individual most uh, involved in setting up the original sawmills, grist mills, town government, you name it, he did it. Uh, and his job was to go and survey the third division of the town, which had not been surveyed. That's uh, predominantly Meredith's neck. But one upshoot, at the time he did that, Meredith Village area, 
was part of the first division. It was included in the first division by the surveys in the 1750s. But I'm sure Ebenezer did not want to lose uh, control of a great waterfall and the opportunity for mill yard. And he didn't want it to fall into the hands of somebody who just used the area for farmland or something like that. So he essentially gerrymandered the lots for the third division. And, and you can see in the, uh, where the red lines are that there are several small lots. Those all belong to the third division. And at the end of the day, uh, who would happen to own them? Ebenezer Smith. So the first settlers arrived in the early 1760s. By 1765, there were a dozen of them. All were located in the uh, part that's now Laconia. 1774, Ebenezer and others made a road from the Province Road. The roads originally went up the first division and then headed west, northwest. Uh, but they took a road and connected the province road to Center Harbor. And it went right through the village. And the road that went through the village is what we know and traverse as Main Street. And it ran right across the base of the bay, or the head of the bay. Um, used to be called Winnipesaukee Street, it's now Route 25. So that uh, opened up the territory for something. Something occurred in 1786. A farmer named John Jennis, uh, Ebenezer Smith, undoubtedly sought him out and basically said, look, John, if you build a sawmill and a, a grist mill on this land, I will give you half of the sawmill and all of the grist mill and I will sell you the land whenever you're in a position to buy it for really cheap money. Um, and so that's, that's what happened. Um, the sawmill went in place in 1786, Chris Mill in 1792. The very first house was built by John Jennis. It's at uh, 56 Main Street, right next to the big yellow house, sort of across from uh, Archie's Park. But the Genesee era ended in 1796. He was a farmer at heart. Uh, he basically, or he did basically, he and Ebenezer Smith signed deeds, turning over the land to him in either 1795 or 1796. 1796, John Genesee sold the mill yard to Samuel Seaver. Samuel Seaver was a clothier from Moultonboro. He wasn't really interested in running a mill yard, but he was interested in running a clothier shop. So he began to sell off portions of the sawmill, the gristmill, uh, and in the case of the sawmill, you can see that uh, it was really divided at different times. They sold halves, they sold quarters, they sold one-eighth shares. Uh, there were other mills that came up. The gristmill was always in half shares. Other mills were built along the stream, fulling mill, uh, carting mill, nail mill, potash mill. The, the key point around those mills is each of those people had some control of the water power. So here you have this old water power that hasn't really been developed too dramatically. Um, and no one or two have control to improve it, because everybody would have a say in it. So by the 1809, the situation began to change. And they call this the John Bond Swayze era, 1809 to 1828. John Bond got together with a gentleman by the name of Daniel Avery. Daniel Avery was a, uh, had a house in Gilmanton, right across the river from, the, from Laconia Bridge, or, or Meredith Bridge as it was known then. He was a miller, uh, a businessman, he was wealthy, he was a trader. He built the first dam in the Winnipesaukee River just above the uh, Meredith Bridge uh, in 1797. And he wasn't individually interested in Meredith Village, except that his brother-in-law decided that he might try to buy up the mill yard in Meredith Village, and he borrowed money from Daniel Avery to do it. Uh, he bought a number of tracks for whatever reason. That man was Ebenezer Kate Robinson 
for whatever reason, uh, he failed, and Daniel Avery uh, had to foreclose on his mortgage. So all of a sudden, Daniel Avery was one of the biggest landowners there, and Daniel, kind of like Ebenezer Smith uh, back in the 1780s, said, well, how am I going to realize value out of this property? And uh, so Daniel struck a, a, a partnership with John Bond Swayze. Daniel had the, the ideas and he had the money. John Bond Swayze had the ambition. He had the energy. He had the know-how. And so it was a great matchup. So by about 1810, 1812, uh, Daniel Avery and John Swayze had bought out almost all the other mills, the sawmill, the grist mill, and they had gained control of the water supply. So John Bond went to work uh, digging a canal. And for a long time, we thought that he, can, he was the one who connected the cove from Lake Wakiwan into Winnipesaukee. In fact, what he did was he put some of the stream from Wakiwan underwater, or underwater, under, uh, underground, and covered it with boards. And he narrowed the channels, and he made a waterfall that was tighter. The tighter, the narrower the channels, the tighter the waterfall, the more power you generate uh, from the speed of the water. Um, in the late 20s, John Bon Swayze did very well. Um, he had one habit that uh, most entrepreneurs still have, and, and certainly back in those days definitely had, which was that he took on debt to do everything he wanted to do. And he bought out uh, Daniel Avery in 1816 by taking on other debt. Um, he decided, decided to buy a 325-acre farm in Center Harbor, did that on debt. Um, so he, he uh, wasn't exactly uh, liquid in cash terms, but he was, he was very rich in assets. But in 1828, he came down with acute appendicitis and passed away. His estate was uh, put in front of the court, and the court ruled that his estate was insolvent, basically forcing the sale of, uh, of the mill yard and everything there. And the sale went to a man named Daniel Smith, Jr. Now, I've said this before, probably this time last year, that there are about 3,500 Daniel Smiths <laughs> who lived in Meredith in the Lakes region. So trying to figure out who's who is, is a real challenge. And uh, so there's a 90 degree, uh, a 90 percent uh, belief that I've got the right connections here. So in any case, uh, Daniel Smith, Jr., was a grand nephew of none other than Ebenezer Smith. And uh, his father uh, was Dan also named Daniel Smith. His father settled in New Hampton and became a very successful businessman there. In fact, the New Hampton village, where the school is, for many years in the early 1800s, was known as Smith Village. This is an inn, the Smith Tavern in New Hampton. That building is still standing. Uh, and uh, Daniel Smith owned it. Uh, Daniel Smith owned the first toll bridge across the Pemigewasset River. Uh, he was a hard-nosed businessman, as well as a successful one. So Daniel Jr., uh, running the cotton, uh, sorry, running the mill yard, he brought in the first large tenant uh, for it, a company called the Meredith Village Manufacturing and Machine Company. Um, this company was making cotton textiles, or was to make cotton textiles. It was in the corporate structure, meaning that there were multiple shareholders, the idea being that you could raise more cash, wasn't dependent on the wealth of an individual. Um, Smith, Daniel Smith, was a co-founder with Joseph Witten Lang, one of uh, the key men who helped build Meredith Village over the years. Um, unfortunately, we have no real insight into how well this company did. 
It uh, does appear, though, that it stayed in business until about 1845, and it would have operated in the old cotton mill that was the building that preceded the Mill Falls Marketplace that exists there today. That spot was always an anchor position within the mill yard. But Daniel Smith benefited greatly in 1849 when the uh, Boston, Concord, and Montreal Railroad uh, pushed its tracks from Concord up through into uh, Meredith Village and then beyond. And among the many upshots of that, I mean, the railroad was, was truly one of the greatest revolutions of the Industrial Revolution. But for Meredith, it meant that the town could now have heavy manufacturing done, heavy meaning heavy equipment, things that needed to be shipped or could be shipped to uh, far markets, particularly places like Boston, where there was more demand. So the first person to take advantage of this was Seneca Ladd. Ladd um, had had a, 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 a wheelwright mill on Hawkins Brook on the end of Plymouth Street during the 1840s. Uh, his mill burned in 1849-1850 uh, and they had no insurance so he was stuck with figuring out the next job. So he decided to uh, build pianos and um, he built the pianos partly because he had had some experience in Boston for about six months as an apprentice but largely because his older brother Albert W. Ladd had started a piano company in 1846 in Boston. And Albert Ladd was one of the best piano makers in the world. He was nationally known, he won international prizes, he was uh, bent on high quality at all costs, and it would be natural for him, for either Seneca to reach out to Albert, or Albert to reach out to Seneca to say, hey, uh, Seneca, you're a woodworker, uh, help me make these pianos. And they did. Um, 1753, Ladd had started building them in his Plymouth uh, barn, his barn on Plymouth Street. It's 91 Plymouth Street that's just being, just got bought, it's being remodeled as we speak. Um, and he uh, rented the uh, old cotton mill uh, that the uh, textile company had left. Uh, his other product was a melodeon. Melodeon is uh, a cheaper uh, piece, it's smaller than a piano, it's easier to learn, uh, they're supposed to be indestructible, and they were built for homes, to be uh, used in homes. And it said that uh, the popularity of the Melodeon was similar in its age to the population, popularity of the black and white TV during the 1950s. Now, I know hardly any of you can remember back to the 50s like I can, but... Uh, uh, meanwhile, uh, Daniel Smith added capacity to the sawmill, uh, to the mill yard. He built what was called, in later years, the old corporate building. This was located on the corner of Dover Street and Main Street, and it was built over the penstock that John uh, Swayze had put uh, under boards underground and it became a general office building. Uh, but as often happens, as we've seen already a few times, 1959, 1859, disaster struck, and the old cotton mill burned. Now, Seneca Ladd was not working in it at the time he had sold his business and uh, had moved uh, on to other things, uh, mostly sales as opposed to manufacturing. But with the burning of the cotton mill, again, that was the largest, only large building that the mill yard had at the time. Uh, that was enough for Daniel Smith. And he realized that it was gonna take a lot more capital. So he got together with another group of Meredith people and formed the Meredith Mechanic Association. And that entity operated the mill yard for 31 years and um, one could easily say that it was during that period that Meredith reached uh, its highest Paris village, its highest point, 
in its in its history in terms of uh, manufacturing and employment. Now, Daniel Smith worked with upper left Joseph Ella, and the right Joseph Wooden Lang, uh, uh, Ebenezer Stevens on my right, and Seneca Ladd on the left. Uh, so they were the five key founders in the MMA. Among the first steps, Joseph Ella built a new fire station. It's funny, they finally caught on. After all these buildings are burning, they might as well uh, get a fire station. It was erected about where the uh, outlet from the upper parking light lot behind Mill Falls uh, runs on to Dover Street. Uh, and that building was there for uh, many decades. In 1859, the MMA built a new hosiery mill. And I think this is a headline from the Meredith News that, that Rusty, or, or uh, sorry, Rudy probably put in there one year. Uh, it was still a mystery of when that uh, building was built. And the, the answer is 1859. Um, it's still with us. He also uh, repaired the flume. Uh, the MMA repaired the flume, made the uh, waterfall even more powerful, repaired the dam, which was located uh, back on the, right near where Dover Street intersects Main Street. Um, whoops. And they moved the uh, tail race, and this is kind of an aside, but sometimes I was just interested in. The tail race is the outlet of the walking one stream uh, into Winnipesaukee. Where does it go in? It's moved around quite a bit during this period. So they moved it next to um, uh, George Clark's uh, building, which is around Heskey Park. 1860, the MMA built this building for George Clark and his brother. Um, George had come to Meredith Village in about 1853, uh, answering an ad from Seneca Ladd, who was look, working, looking for more people to uh, work in his piano factory. When Ladd sold the business in 1859, George Clark set up his own lumber business uh, in the mill yard. Meanwhile, the MMA was working hard to find a tenant for the new hosiery mill, meaning the uh, Meredith Falls, uh, Mill Falls Marketing Place. Um, they reached out initially, the building was built for one Thomas Appleton, who was uh, a, uh, a hosiery miller in Lake Village. And Appleton apparently said, you know, he wanted to move over here and he would move in. They built the building, he never moved in. Uh, it changed hands to a guy named Thomas Ward for a few years. Um, and the trail really runs pretty dry until we see the name Smith and Phelps, of which I don't know anything about, haven't been able to find them. But they apparently enjoyed some very strong years making hosiery during the Civil War. Um, they lasted, ran the mill, until the uh, early 1870s uh, when it closed. There were other tenants that the MMA had as well, worthy of note. Nathan B. Wadley was a homegrown Meredith boy. Uh, the Wadley family um, uh, sort of dominated the area that's off of Parade Road and Reservoir Road. Um, Nathan B. rented the sawmill and the grist mill from the MMA. He probably also rented both of them uh, from Daniel Smith before that, but there aren't complete records for it. Uh, John A. Lang uh, was a woodworker who bought the piano business from Lang, uh, sorry, from Seneca Ladd in 1859, uh, and Jaziel Robinson began making organs around the same time. And both Lang and Robinson worked on the upper floors of the uh, Clark Mill. In 1872, the mill yard eliminated its sawmill entirely. Uh, Nathan B. Wadley, who had been running it, uh, had begun to build out this new mill, it was called the Meredith Shook and Lumber Mill, on Church Point. He bought the land in 1866, uh, but the operation did not get up and running until 1872. 
Um, but at that point, what was John Jenna's original sawmill, 1786, uh, was taken down entirely. But the MMA was not through. Uh, in 1874, they were successful in recruiting this guy, Sam Hodson, uh, who had a company called the Man Walking Lawn Manufacturing Company. Hodson was an Englishman who had emigrated to the U.S. in 1866. He settled in Lowell. Before coming over, he had worked in hosiery mills, textile mills, so he's well versed in it. He worked in the Lowell Mills for a few years, and then he went up to Lake Village, where he worked for a couple more years, uh, and he met a guy named William Abel there. Abel was a, an inventor, a very bright inventor of uh, equipment, and this whole industry during this period, the textile industry, was evolving dramatically. New inventions all the time. So they had... Uh, Hudson and uh, Abel had a building that apparently also caught fire and uh, put a dent in their business. And that gave the opportunity for Hudson to come over here to Meredith. Uh, Hudson's business grew unbelievably fast. And the reason was that Abel had invented two new machines that automated the entire process of making stockings or hosiery. Um, before they could make parts and then the heels and the toes had to be outsourced and all the sewing to put the pieces together had to be outsourced. Uh, so it was a very laborious process. But with um, the new equipment installed and I think uh, Hodson built new built th at least three new buildings. This was the last of them. Um, their employment went from somewhere around uh, you know 75 to as many as 165, 175. And uh, at the same time in 1880, another new tenant showed up. The American Twist Drill Company was recruited from Rhode Island. Uh, that company took up quarters in the 1859 mill, or the Mill Falls Marketplace building. So Meredith uh, was really booming. Um, you can see some of these employment figures here, and if you include the Shook and Lumber, Clark, and so on, those were very big numbers for uh, a growing, a small growing town. Now, of course, one problem with a small but very fast growing town is where do people sleep? There were big housing shortages going on. Uh, the MMA built a house at, I think it would be 20 Main Street, um, and uh, it's called a mansard house. If you see the shape of that roof, uh, kind of evolved in the 1850s. They flattened it off so that people would have more standing room on the upper floor. And you can see a couple others of those that are still in town. Uh, the MMA also built another corporate building. This was down on lower Main Street right next to the Horn Building. The Horn Building is on the right there. Um, that building housed, among others, an Ambrose Furniture Company uh, that came along. The MMA also built three houses uh, for boarding houses on uh, Dover Street. So this is a village in 1889 in the Mill Yard. And, you know, just to kind of reorient. You can see in the upper left Hodson's Mill. And you can see that there are multiple mills tied together and that they're all detached from the 1859 mill building, which had been the core of the, uh, of the mill yard. Uh, you see Clark's building over on the right and the tail race from the stream going under the building and out. This is an 1889 depiction, artist depiction of Meredith Village, and just provided to give a little uh, different perspective. Looks like New Jersey, <laughs> but uh, it, it's a little more crowded than we think of, uh, of Meredith. But uh, you can see Hodgson's big building there, Clark's on the water, Mansard House, 1859 building. Again, that's the Mill Falls Marketplace. 
uh, the old corporate building up by the corner of Dover and Maine, and then just for perspective, the lad block on the left there, upper left. Well, surprise, surprise, 1889, another disaster, another fire. In this case, Hodson's, all of Hodson's mills burned to the ground. And the uh, corporate building built next to the Horn building also was part of that fire. This was a, a sheer disaster for Meredith, uh, and it led to the demise of the MMA. It decided in 1890 to sell the mill yard. The moving voice behind uh, the dissolution was Seneca Ladd. He was the largest shareholder by far in the corporation. He called the meeting to sell, sell it. But part of his motivation was he was up there in age himself. He died two years later. But his key partners, Joseph Wooden Lang, had died in 1886, and Joseph Ella had died in 1890. And so I think they were just tired and they didn't want to take it another step. So they looked around for a buyer and the buyer turned out to be a company called the Meredith Water Power Company. Now it's interesting because initially Hodson tried to raise funding to buy the company, uh, but he wasn't able to do it. They sort of say the old money just, they'd had enough. They were. They were done. Um, about the time that this was circulating around, a gentleman by the name of E.E. E. Beattie stepped in, and he was a moneyed man, and he got together with E.C. Mansfield, and I'll talk a little bit more about both these guys in a second, and they bought the mill yard for $12,500. Uh, E.E. Beattie uh, was a revolutionary, or sorry, a Civil War soldier, from Meredith. Uh, he was a major. He fought at Chancellorsville. He was captured at Chancellorsville. He was imprisoned uh, at the Libby prison, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but after the war, he got out. He was visiting in Washington, D.C. He happened to be at the theater when President Lincoln was shot. He went to Lincoln's side and was with him at his death. Uh, after the war, Beatty decided he needed to find his future somewhere else, so he went to South Africa and the diamond fields of South Africa. And he did fairly well over there. Uh, he returned to the U.S., a very wealthy man. He became a broker down in Boston, uh, but he hadn't lost his ties entirely to Meredith. And as fate would have it, he happened to be around in that 1890 era when the mill yard came up for sale, uh, E.C. Mansfield and a couple others uh, got a hold of him and he enthusiastically uh, supported with the majority of the money, I'm sure, the purchase of the mill yard. And E.E. E. also uh, donated the statue, the Civil War statue, to the town that still sits in front of the library. Um, so he definitely had his roots here. Mansfield uh, was a traveling salesman in the 1870s. He uh, family moved from Vermont to Massachusetts. He came up to New Hampshire from Massachusetts. He stayed in the Elm Hotel, uh, and he would take his car to goods and drive around and make sales. But um, you, you talk about timing being everything in life. You know, we're talking about 1880 now, when Meredith Village was taking off. And since Meredith Village was taking off, Mansfield was going to stay. Uh, so he set up his own shop, uh, his own store, and for many years he occupied the building on the left there, which is 48 Main Street. It's the yellow building. Uh, it was originally built by Joseph Wooden Lang. Lang had a store there before Mansfield. Uh, and it's right across the street from the Historical Society. You can see the fountain and post office square there. So, 1892, this is after the fire, and you can see that uh, all of Hodgson's buildings are gone, and all we have for a large building is the um, 1859 mill, and Clark's building 
down by the water, we still have the uh, corporate building. The other corporate building is no longer there. It, it burned in the fire as well. Uh, the water power company inherited a, a list of 10 clients. The total monthly rent was a little over $1,500. Uh, these were the two largest, George Clark and John Lang. And as you can see, that's, they comprise about two-thirds of the rental income. But uh, they went to work at it. In 19, 1892, they recruited a company called United States Linen. It was a brand new company that had incorporated in Chicago. But apparently, that company lasted only about a year. Um, and it may have to do with the, uh, there was a severe downturn in uh, the early 17, in the 1890s. And uh, perhaps they, they just couldn't make it. But they also recruited in 1893 the Meredith Electric Light Company. And uh, the first electric lights were turned on in Meredith the next year in 1894. Um, I said lights, it's possible it was one light. I'm not sure, but uh, in any case, that's when it started. Uh, they occupied space in the uh, old 1859 mill. Um, 1895, the Beatty Group uh, got an offer. It decided not to refuse. 25000 in other words, it doubled its investment from when it went in. The new buyer was John Quincy Adams Whittemore. Um, John Whittemore uh, is a very wealthy businessman from Newton, Massachusetts. Uh, his father had founded the Whittemore shoe polish business in the 1850s. It had grown to be an international and national uh, product that was, uh, uh, did extremely well. John Whittemore and his brother Charles inherited the business after their dad died. How wealthy was John? Well, in 1906, he paid $135,000 for a summer estate on Buzzards Bay down at the Cape. And I think, if I recall, it was probably 50 to 100 acres. Um, you know, since 135,000 will be able to rent a room up at Church Landing now <laughs> versus buy a house, I think you get the perspective of what that property must have been worth. Uh, this is the Woodmore Mansion in Newton, Massachusetts, uh, still standing. So one of the first things John did was to build a new mill building. And he built it off the front of the old cotton mill building, the old 1859 mill building. Um, this is an 1899 map. The building was built for the American Flax Company that came in in 1897. Uh, the American Flax Company uh, built um, flax, linen, crash, they're called crash towels, linen crash. Uh, it's very durable towels used in homes especially. It's very popular. Um, when uh, American came in, with them, they brought Allie Hall and his brother uh, Minot. Uh, they were young kids uh, in their 20s from the Boston area. Excuse me. Uh, Minot, uh, by the way, was ended up marrying uh, Cassandra Swayze Lincoln, who happened to be the great uh, granddaughter of John Bon Swayze. So there's a magnetism about this mill yard that. Uh, needs to be explored more. Um, the American Flax Company moved out in 1901. I don't think Whittemore had a big role in it. He might have been a shareholder, um, but uh, he wasn't uh, a guiding light. It moved out because it was having too much success at Meredith and it outgrew the facilities. So Indian Orchard, Massachusetts is part of Springfield on the Connecticut River, and you can see the dam there um, a little bit more than our 38-footer could come up with back in those days. So another new company came along in 1901 to replace 
American, and that was the Atlas Lending Company. Now this company, I believe, was largely financed and spearheaded by John Q.A. Whitaker. You note in the write-up here that Minot Hall is listed as president and Alley Hall as treasurer. So what you don't see are, are professional managers. These guys, the Halls, were great at what they did. What, what they did was they ran, they ran textile mills. They weren't necessarily financial wizards or tied into the money, the money people, that sort of thing. Uh, Atlas never did very well. Um, by their own publicity, they lost heavily during their eight years of existence. Um, the problem was they couldn't compete with foreign linen crash. The Irish and the Scotch were the toughest competitors worldwide. They got their flax locally. They paid no duties. Atlas imported all of its flax from Europe, and they had to pay duties. And the duties was a, a big issue around that time. Um, the Payne Aldrich bill was passed by Congress, um, and uh, it, it didn't do anything to help the flax people. So in 1917, uh, or sorry, from 1909 to 1917, Atlas was recapitalized and uh, formed a new corporation called Meredith Linen Company, with George Jordan as president from Boston, and you can see Alley as a general manager. And I believe Whitaker was still probably a major shareholder. The capital stock was $100,000, quite a bit of money. Um, and the company was still producing pure linen crash and towels, and all their flax was imported from Europe. So Meredith Linen Company, uh, one of the noticeable changes they made, uh, again, was with the tail race, not the trail race, but the tail race. Um, you can see, and the map on the left is in 1899, that's where the tail race went under the Clark Building. This map is 1912, and it's approximately where it sits today, uh, sometime during that Meredith Linen Company era. Uh, they decided that they could get greater power by uh, moving the tail race over. Um, Atlas business uh, was waylaid by World War I uh, because of the imported flax. The Meredith, that, exactly, that was actually the Meredith uh, Lending Company. Uh, and in 1917, Meredith Lending Company sold out to Meredith Linen Mills, Inc. Uh, and we started a new era. Uh, by 1917, Whittemore had had enough. Uh, he sold the mill yard for 25000 That's what he paid for it. Uh, Meredith Linen Corporation um, sort of restored corporate ownership to the mill yard itself. So before, we had Whittemore owning the mill yard and companies leasing the factories and owning the equipment and so forth. In this case, Meredith Linen Mills, Inc., took over the whole shebang. They made a number of new investments, aggressive investments, enhancing the water power. It's kind of one of these themes that we hear over decades. They rock lined the flume. And uh, this is a recent picture of the flume. Um, I don't know for a fact, but I wouldn't be surprised if uh, a lot of that stonework that exists out there today was put in place in 1917 by Meredith Linden Mills. Uh, it, they worked on the penstocks. Penstocks are basically the channels between the, the dams and, the, and the, uh, uh, the mill buildings where the wheels were located. Uh, I'm not sure the date of this picture either. I think it's probably around 1910, but it gives you a, a good perspective on some of the uh, uh, depth or extent of work that they undertook to uh, run the Waukewan stream through its canal, if you will, underground, uh, down to the waterfall. Uh, working conditions in the Meredith Linden Mills, Inc. So they're mostly women and children. They work 10-hour days, six days a week. They earn 10 cents an hour, but 
that was raised to 15 cents in 1912. Um, but they had no perks. But they had jobs, and there weren't that many jobs around in those days. Inside the mill, very crowded, very noisy. Uh, you know, I think in history class we read stories about some of these operations. Uh, the 1920s were boom years for the company. They did very well. They became the largest employer in the village by far. Uh, they uh, kind of were the, the power behind the throne within the village. In the 30s, along came the Depression, and the company struggled. In 1935, a controlling interest was sold to a New York investor. I do not know the details, but basically that says that the uh, existing owners you know, were, were stuck, had no ideas, and they wanted to get out. And this guy was probably a bottom fisher looking to acquire uh, companies that are on the down and outs waiting for the next turnaround. But he couldn't revive it either. Um, in 1941, uh, the company was sold to Egon Husky, Heskey. Uh, Heskey was a Czechoslovakian who had moved to Canada before World War II. He started the Heskey Flax products there in Ontario. And he used, uh, supplied it with Canadian flax. And he didn't use European imports. So Heskey recapitalized the Meredith operation. Uh, and he got product out the door under the name of Meredith Heavy Pure Linen Kitchen Towels. Somebody here probably has some of those at home, I know. <laughs> In 1945, um, the uh, state decided to reroute US-3 along the uh, lakefront. And so that, as you can kind of see in the upper right, that's Clark's old building. The highway went through there and then across. Uh, and obviously, it's in the location we know all too well today. From 46 to 48, uh, Heskey's business did pretty well. Employment jumped from 100 to 150, and he put in some new buildings facing the lake along Route 3. But uh, as the 40s uh, rolled out, by October 48, there was a big downturn. They never recovered. The mill was closed on May 31st. 1950 and shut. In 1951, uh, a new company entered the picture. Keysby and Madison, uh, it's a Pennsylvania-based company that made asbestos uh, linen, asbestos cloth. Uh, at the time, the ills of asbestos were not known, and in Meredith, the purchase was greeted with Tremendous enthusiasm, because it meant jobs. The mill yard had gone to seed, it meant it would be cleaned up. And uh, Keysby invested a lot of money in doing that. Um, in 1952, they put in this 30 by 90 uh, cinder block building that uh, for all of us who've driven along Route 3 during that era, can't help but remember. Um, in 62, however, and for, and for Keysby, I mean, they just went about their business. The asbestos issues never rose their heads while Keysby was here. In 62, it was acquired, and the Meredith operation, Keysby had eight or nine other plants all across the country, but the Keysby uh, operation in Meredith was sold, and it was sold to Amatex. Amatex stands for American Asbestos Textile Corporation. Uh, and as I just mentioned, Amatex was another uh, company in the asbestos industry. Uh, they made asbestos linen cloth. Um, but by the 70s, the word about asbestos was getting out dramatically. This is a headline article from the Washington Post in 1978. And uh, 
you know, in these in these scandals, there are always two kind of things that that pop up pretty regularly. First is that uh, the company doesn't inform people of what's going on. You know, the less said, the better, from their standpoint. Um, and uh, the uh, people just didn't know. I mean, how many of us, if you think back to those days, really had any sense of the asbestos, the peril that became associated with asbestos? You know, I remember hearing about it, and yeah, maybe it wasn't good, but by the way, I've got pipes in my house that I swing from every day and when I'm a kid. So, you know, it, it, was, it, was, that, it was that era. Um, but by the 70s, everybody knew about it. Um, <laughs> Quote from somebody who worked in the Amatex mill in town. They never told us much of anything. Uh, they were dumping waste, at least some waste, in the lake until 1976. They finally had to shut down operations, and the property became just a worsening eyesore. There were at least 9,000 lawsuits against Amatex by the 1980s, and the company finally filed for bankruptcy in 1982. And the mill was closed permanently in 1982. Uh, but out of the blue came the Meredith Bay Corporation in 1983. The white knight arrives. <laughs> Rusty McClear, Meredith Bay, Hampshire Holiday, Hampshire Hospitality Holdings, Mill Falls, bought the property uh, from Amatex. And they came in, as everybody knows, but it's just such a wonderful story. And uh, I just have so much respect for what they accomplished and how they accomplished it. And how well the town worked with them to let them accomplish it. Uh, you have the 1859 mill on the left there. That was repurposed and preserved. The waterfall, which, um, you know, driving down Route 3 for the better part of 40 years, I had never seen, because it was hidden among the buildings, um, was brought to life for all of us to see. And this is the, uh, the beauty that Rusty and his team of people brought forth and for all of us to appreciate every time we come by. But as fate would have it, as it always does, um, Running an operation like this is very expensive. It takes a lot of money to maintain these old buildings and to keep them up to date, the roofs go, whatever goes, it takes a lot of money. And um, Rudy's company just did not have that kind of money. So they had to sell. And in 2019, they sold to this company. And we'll give a brownie to anybody who can pronounce that name, because I can't. Um, in any case, I think the main takeaway is that it's a private equity fund. It's not a public company. It doesn't have shareholders. It's private equity. That means very, very, very wealthy people, investment banks, contribute X millions of dollars into this equity fund. And it's used and, and, and directed to specific industry niches. And the niche here is real estate and hospitality. So that line that uh, more than $10 million of diversified real estate investments, more than 160 cities across 31 states, coast to coast. Um, this represents a massive change in the way business is done in our little town of Merida. Um, but uh, we have it, and life goes on. <laughs> Do I have any questions? <laughs>